There are some things in this world and in history which are just hard to take. And one of the biggest things probably is for me is German cruiser policy and procurement during the 1930s and World War II. Why? Because the German Navy had produced some very fine, very capable cruisers in the run-up to World War One and in the 1890s. In fact, that was one of the saving graces of the German Navy, the quality of the cruisers they produced. They, well, they never had the infrastructure or the finance to match the Royal Navy in their true capabilities, but the cruisers they produced were really quite something. And they were well crewed and well led, and the Germans produced some very fine cruiser officers. Von Spey being a good example of them. People often ask me, when the topic of Von Spey, you know, what would have happened if he'd made it back to Germany and all these things? Well, yes, he'd have been involved in the war. And as I've said before, if he made it back, depending on how he made it back, if he managed to get his whole squadron somehow back to Germany itself, it's very difficult to see how that doesn't earn him a massive promotion and probably at some point command of the High Seas Fleet. Maybe not straight away, but certainly quite soon. Especially if it's after Car if Coronel happens as, as it did, but somehow Falklands doesn't happen, he gets it home, part of the force home past the Royal Navy, well, you know, that's such a prestigious thing. It's also pretty much impossible for him to actually do, but if he did it, frankly, he'd be worthy of getting the role. But the big thing is, you would have had possibly the most senior and influential cruiser admiral of his generation in the German Navy at home with the German Navy during the 1920s and 1930s, during the Weimar years, during the time it's the Reichsmarine, and even possibly when it becomes the Kriegsmarine. He wasn't that old. He probably would have retired before World War II, etc. happened, but he could well have been a big part of all of this. Would that have had a massive difference? I don't know. Honestly, I wish they'd listened to Holzen off more. That would have certainly produced a far more finely balanced fleet for the task they were asked to do. But no, they didn't. And there are several problems with the entire German structure. And... Let me start off before I get into some explaining something before we do. Normally, I have a script. I have some key phrases written down there and points I want to hit as I go through. Because that's how I work when I'm giving a presentation. I don't have an entire, or any lecture or anything, entire script written out. I have it sort of point to point. Before I do that, I write bullet points. I've tried the sort of semi-scripted method about four times with this video, with this topic. Haven't liked any of them, so I've gone back to the bullet points. So I'm going to apologize now if it's a little weird, but this thing, this topic, I'm not a fan of totalitarian organizations and regimes. There is a thing of that I'm already not, a, no one's a fan of the way they have a tendency to go with genocide and various other things of basically killing or other ways getting rid of people who disagree with them or who might cause them trouble or just people they don't like. But beyond that, and this is something I learnt because the trouble is with history, especially history in the UK, you do spend a lot of time studying Nazi Germany. Which you both should, but also at points it does kind of make you go to a depth which you probably don't want to go. Especially if you're inclined to read further than teachers, etc. are requiring of you anyway. And what really annoys me with totalitarian regimes, and has really annoyed me with preparing both the Soviet and the German videos at this current time, it's the sheer damn inefficiency, excuse the French. 
It's not just 11 inch guns. And here is the thing, you will hear me many times critique the Deutschen class because they have 11 inch guns. Why? Because it makes them neither, neither fish nor fowl. Because it automatically means that if you're a Royal Navy, etc., engaging them, you're either looking at sending a cruiser task force to deal them, which means it's firepower they can't deal with, or if you're French, it's going to be a cruiser task force, or it's going to be a capital ship. Either a fast battleship or a battle cruiser is going to come. So you've automatically made ships which are going to have a big target on their back. Yes, they have status. Yes, they give you presents. Yes, they allow you to sing from the moons that you have a pocket battleship or whatever different papers want to call it. Let's be honest, a heavy cruiser with bumped up guns or where probably a heavy cruiser would actually have its guns at that time if the treaties had actually allowed for a proper heavy cruiser to be in existence. But still... For all that vaunted capability, in terms of the Deutschland class, what do you actually get? Well, you get a vessel which displaces 14,500 tons fully loaded. So that's four and a half, well, four, 4,200 tons less fully loaded than a HIPAA class. Has a top speed of 28 knots, so can be caught by pretty much any cruiser that's under that time manufacture, and even a few that are World War One era. Has a range of 10,000 nautical miles at 20 knots, which is impressive. That is a very impressive thing. But they carry six 11-inch guns in two triple turrets. And now, if I was talking about the Renown class, you'd hear me go, well, six 15-inch guns in three twin turrets. That's a capable armament for a battle cruiser. In three turrets. And they're 15-inch guns. That's powerful. So what's my problem with them? Honestly, the Germans could have made a very good line of heavy cruisers. They could have. Treaty of Versailles, they'd give them certain limitations. Then the Anglo-Naval Treaty, etc. gave them other limitations. But honestly, they could have probably carried on building these. Instead of Scharnhorst and Eisenau. Instead of the Hippers. They could have made cruisers which had nine 11 inch guns. They could have made them slightly bigger so that they could achieve slightly higher speeds with their diesels. It's got eight man diesel engines with two propellers, two shafts. Okay. Add in a third shaft. Add in another four diesel engines. Yes. You are probably going to increase the shaft horsepower from 53,260 to... I don't know. Somewhere in the region of 80,000 shaft horsepower. You probably get it up to 30-something knots. Let's say 31, 32 probably. You could still probably keep the range, especially if you carried enough fuel. And with 9 11-inch guns, you've suddenly got a vessel which is very sensible German cruiser policy. Because what do you really need a fleet for? What does Germany really need capital ships for? Well, that's status, broadly speaking. But capital ships armed with 11-inch guns are capital ships which... No one's really going to be worried about. They're going to worry about them from the point of view of them tangling the smaller things. 
They're not big things. There's going to be nothing out there big. HMS Renown stares down charges and drives off Shan Horse and Nice now. Now, yes, you can argue that they're ordered to not take damage and all these things because they are led, the entire country is led by someone who's a moron. And please note, I am using that in the phrase of... I don't know how to put this. Completely tunnel-visioned. There was an interesting video, I've seen a few of them recently going... Why do we think that Hitler had any logic that he was about achieving the best for Germany? Because he what didn't go about it. He wasn't necessarily achieving the best result because, let's be honest, there are things he does which are hopelessly undermining of the war effort. True. But that's relying on him having the same logical view of us as to what would be best and how it can be done. And some people honestly do live in a fantasy world where they can win victories without ever suffering a loss. Where they can cause tremendous trouble for Royal Navy at sea without risking anything. And let's be honest, Plan Z does not produce a balanced fleet. Ten battleships, six of which will be the H-Class. Two of which had started in January 1939, in sort of 1939, by the time war began. But let's be honest, what does that really help you with? Because you've got the Shan Horse, you've got Bismarck and Tirpitz, and now you're going for 6H class? Wow, are you planning on matching the Royal Navy in every single stupid decision it makes? The Royal Navy had three different... Calibers of guns going on. Do you go trying to do that logistically as well with less naval infrastructure to support them? And then there's the battle cruisers, all to be O class. Aircraft carriers, including two Graf Zeppelins. If you want a scary thing, at one point the Soviet Union is looking into buying a Graf Zeppelin or building one based on the designs. That could have led to a showdown in the in the Baltic between two carrier groups, one led by the Graf Zeppelin, one led by whatever the Soviet Union ended up calling it. <laughs> oh, good lord! I would not like to see the results of that battle. Anyway, fifteen Panzer Chief. Oh, goody! So they built the Panzer Chief, the Deutschen class. Decided they didn't want them, then started building heavy cruisers, and then decide actually, no, it's Panzer Chief you want after all. Panzer Chief were the sensible things to fill the role of heavy cruisers from the beginning for the German Navy. Light cruisers! Huh. Well, you know, it's always nice to know you're going to build seven different ones, seven M class vessels. Scout cruisers, 22 of them. And again, these vessels are missing. You are already building a fleet from scratch. This is the point. They, they start off by building the Emden. They build this new cruiser to help them rebuild. And yet, The German Navy is starting from a position of, thank the post Treaty of Versailles, of absolute shock. Yes, they had honour, but what was their honour? The honour lay at the bottom of Scarpa Flow. That was it. You can. Try and tart up Jutland all you like. But if it was really a victory for the Germans, then what did they do with it? 
if you win a victory, you should you have to do something. So either they won something and then they threw away what they lost a lot of lives to win and to achieve, or they didn't win anything. And this is the absolute problem with the German Navy. And this is the problem with Plan Z, because again, building this, why are they building this fleet? Is it to take on the French? Well, you're building a force of 13 capital ships. The French have like six. That's more than you need for that. And you can talk about the Soviet Union, but it's time they're technically allies. And technically the Germans are supplying all the designs and all the key equipment for the Soviet Union. And they really do know the state of the Soviet Union's construction program and building capabilities. So I can't think they're scared of them. Because if they are, then they must be imagining the German, the Soviet Union is doing a really great Maskara Volka. An absolutely amazing uh, mirage of their capabilities. And the, the, Germ the capabilities the Germans are seeing are completely put on to lie to them. Sixty-eight destroyers, ninety torpedo boats, and twenty-two scout cruisers. So let's say you're building a fleet, and you're building a fleet with the idea of doing naughty things to your opponents. And these are your surface elements alone. There are various plans for submarine numbers, but let's be honest, submarine numbers at this point are even more of a mirage and a phantom than the surface ship numbers. It's, again, one of those interesting things. The Germans end up fighting a submarine war. And that's what they're known for. But if you look at how many submarines they have going into World War II in September 1939... You can sort of excuse the British for not really thinking the Germans are prepared to do such a thing, and having been, to an extent, kind of slow in their preparations for such a war. But there again, of course, the British were planning on a war in 1942 or afterwards, and the Germans were planning on a war in the middle of the 1940s. And no one was planning on a war in 1939. It's amazing. You're not planning on a war, but you're doing the aggressive things anyway. And what is this cruiser policy about? Well, you've got a load of light cruisers, and you've got a load of Panzer Chief. So what can we tell about the cruiser policy of Plan Z? It's a presence force. It's an operational capability. Let's be honest, the light cruisers, no matter what they might say, especially the ones which have the uh, variously off-centered aft turrets, are more mine layers than light cruisers. That's their role, to be able to deploy minefields. And dominates, to an extent, the Baltic. Heavy cruisers are the things which stick out. You're putting a lot of effort, you're wasting a lot of tonnage, a lot of shipyard space on them. I'd argue there's also Nishan, Horse, and Nisenau, because as much as I like those ships, they are literally my favourite battleships of the German Navy of World War II. They're also the battleships which make the least sense. Because you're literally building a ship to say you have built a battleship when you do not have any capability to build any gun bigger than 11 inches at that time. You know, it, you'd have been better off building a nine-gun Panzer Chief and just kept churning those out. Yes, they're not battleships, but if you consider that you had the two Scharnhorst and Eisenhower in service, and you had the three Hippers in service, and you started to work on their two sisters, and uh, so you had five of those on the construction, and you had other vessels under construction. If you put all that effort into just focusing on Panzer Chief, on a 9, 11-inch gun Panzer Chief, you think what you could have made in terms of numbers? 
And then you think about all the other powers turning around because, yes, you're building an 11-inch cruiser, but it's not a battleship. And can Britain and France really start to say, we're so scared of them when Britain has hood? And it'll go, oh, you're scared of a cruiser with 11, 9 11 inch guns. You've got a battle cruiser with 8 15 inch guns. Pull the other one. And you add up the numbers and you think, well, they could have possibly churned out as many as 10 of those. And would 10 of those, slightly bigger, slightly faster Panzer Sheaf, have been more useful for the German Navy than the Hippers, than the Panzer Sheaf, and than Scharnhorst and Eisenhower? It's a question they never think about. And that's because of the three strands of German naval cruiser policy you have the theoretical strand where the cruisers are going to do every cruiser mission ever imagined and ever thought possible they are going to provide you with all the advantages and none of the disadvantages they are going to be amazing then you have the plan procurement where the numbers don't quite fit the mission specs but no, that's fine. Uh, it will do. You can do certain things. You can do those missions, just not all at the same time, and not in the and probably not in the series. But you can do uh, some of them parallel, and you can do some of them after a little bit of a refit in between. It works. And then, and then, you have the reality. You have what is actually built and actually available. Mm-hmm. What is actually built and actually available. Deutschland class. Well, you start off the war with Deutschland, which promptly gets renamed Lutzau very quickly, after the Germans realised that it, the British are going, hang on, wasn't one of the cruisers that's out from Germany called Germany? Yes. Where is she? She got home, but it was a touch and go, and thanks to some very creative interpretation of... Um, territorial integrities. Then you have Admiral Scheer. Now, she's the Deutschen class which is heard least about in World War II, really. But she'd been critical of the Spanish Civil War. And in World War II, she does an Atlantic store, a sortie. She deploys to Norway. She does things in the Baltic. She is an actually a pretty critical vessel. She, 1942, she does Operation Wonderland, which is a sortie into the Kara Sea. Goes and interdicts Soviet sh shipping, attacking Tiger's Opportunity. You know, she didn't get a destroyer escort because, well, the length of the operation precluded them because they would have run out of fuel. And again, this makes you very sorry that the Germans didn't build those scout cruisers because let's be honest what would the scout cruisers be in reality they'd be destroyers for long-range missions they make sense what's the german navy shortage throughout world war ii that cripples all other operations all convoying all operate all convoying all abilities to get and sortie out there Larger ships to sea, it's fuel, yes, but it's also the fact that they have none of these escorts. And if you think about it, with the fuel, they have the fuel, but it's moving the fuel around. And again, if you had these light cruisers, if you had the scout cruisers, if you had the destroyers and the torpedo boats in service and ready to go in the 1930s, 
especially in 1939, it would have been far stronger. Admiral Scheer, well, she actually has an interesting career in certain things other than Operation Wonderland. She's, you know, part of the force which deploys to Norway in February 1942, when she takes the Prince Jürgen, the Richard Belzen, which is the destroyer, the Paul Jacobi, the destroyer, uh, the Z-25, the Hermann Sherman, and the Friedrich Ilk there. They do Operation Rüsselprung as well. Which is another plan to intercept Arctic convoys. It's something the Germans do keep doing. They do keep trying to intercept Arctic convoys with surface raiders. It's one of those things when people sort of start talking about PQ-17. It's sometimes treated as, oh, the Germans never come out. No, they did often come out. And that's part of the problem. But this is the renamed Deutschland. Renamed the Lutzer. But the fact is, her and Admiral Scheer, they are in many ways the backbone of the German heavy cruiser force throughout World War II. And when you think about it, if you look at the Hippers, well, Blucher gets sunk, as of course does Grass Bay early on in the war. And then you have Hipper and Prince Jürgen. So you have really four heavy cruisers. The Germans theoretically have four capital ships and four heavy cruisers at one point. I've said many times the German Navy would, well, not just kill, they, they'd walk, they'd crawl over hot coals for a Navy the size of the Regia Marina. They really would. That would have given them capabilities which you cannot imagine how scary it would have been for the Allies, for the various powers to deal with. Why don't they? Oh, starting point, people go to the Treaty of Versailles. It has a lot of interesting factors into it. The Treaty of Versailles includes provisions that the Reichswehr, the whole armed forces, were to be incapable of offensive action and to encourage international disarmament, basically. So not just them to disarm, but other people were supposed to. Their army was to be no more than 100,000 strong in a maximum of seven infantry and three cavalry divisions. The treaty laid down the organization of the divisions and support units, and the general staff was to be dissolved. Military schools for officer training were limited to three, one school per arm, and conscription was abolished. Privates and soldiers and non-commissioned officers were to be retained for at least 12 years, and officers for a minimum of 25 years with former officers being forbidden to attend to military exercises. This was all to prevent Germany building up a cadre of trained personnel and then being able to call them up from reserve. So the number of men allowed to leave early was limited. There were limited criteria for why we would be allowed to leave the army early. The number of civilian staff for supporting the army were reduced, and the police was reduced to its pre-war size with M increases limited to population increases. And paramilitary forces are forbidden. Rhineland demilitarized. And all sorts of things with military structures. Germany was prohibited from the arms trade. And Heligand, etc. were well, the fortifications there were to be destroyed. The German Navy is allowed to retain six pre-dreadnought battleships and six light cruisers. These were not to exceed 6,100 tons. 12 destroyers, 
not exceeding 800 tons, and 12 torpedo boats, not exceeding 200 tons, and were forbidden submarines. The Navy's total personnel was not to exceed 15,000. This was to include manning for the fleet, coast defences, signal stations, administration, other land services, officers and men of all grades and corps. Number of officers and warrant officers was not allowed to exceed 1,500. Article 198 prohibited Germany from having an air force including naval air forces, and required Germany to hand over all aerial-related materials. So, okay. But, the thing is, Germany doesn't keep these restrictions for quite a long time. And then, when you start to think about it, if you're going to replace... Start replacing the pre-Drenauts with Deutschland-class cruisers. And let's be honest, they are cruisers. Well, you've built three. Now, the reason they've built three is because, well, some of the... Various interesting battleships actually stay in service. Uh, they actually keep the Hanover in service till 1944. The Scheldtig, I think, is in service to a uh, Scheldtig in, in service till 1945, and the Scheldtig Holstein, which I, um, I I do know, um, one of my colleagues really really loves to say the name of. All in service for as much of World War II as the Germans can have them. But again, these are ships which, frankly, should have been got rid of and replaced. And you can say, oh well, you know, did could they make the case for it? Well, they all been they been launched in 1906. Oh, 1905 and 1906. So, yeah. They're all over 20 years old in the 1930s. The Germans could have made a thing of replacing them quite quickly. Keeping them allows them to grow their numbers, yes, but it also means they're having to provide crew for these ships and sustain these ships and use the infrastructure for these ships. Now, the Germans are famous for the 11 inch guns. They're famous also for offset guns as well, for the, the lighter cruisers. And why are they offset? Well, if you look here, you can actually work it out quite quickly. You start to see sort of tracks running down the picture. Those tracks are for mines. They're offset in order to make it easier to operate as a mine layer. To give you more space to do that. The guns are also pointing rearwards because presumably these ships are going to have to be evacuating the area fast after laying mines offensively. And remember, mine warfare is as offensive as it is defensive. It is supposed to restrict the movement of the enemy and allow you to better able focus your own attacks. The first ship they had built under the restriction of the treaty uh, was the Emden, which was built in the 1920s. Then you have the Königsberg class. That's Königsberg, Kalbusch, and Kolm. And then Leipzig and Nuremberg, which are basically modified Königsberg class. The Germans have a dummy corporation. NV Ingenieskota uh, Ingenieskatal vor Schiffsbau, uh, IVS in the Netherlands, um, secretly continuing de continue development of submarines. Now, one of the interesting things is there is often a debate as to whether or not various powers knew this was in existence. 
I would say the odds are fairly strong that pretty much everyone knew in the various nations intelligence services this is what the Germans were doing, but it was better to have them doing it where everyone knew and probably everyone had a chance of finding out what they need to find out from it than have them actually doing something actually in secret. It's one of those things. If you want to develop a secret weapon, you have two choices. Do you want it to be a deterrent, and do you want people to know about it? Well, then you make sure it's in your known secret hidey place. Very secure, but everyone knows where it is, so everyone sort of monitors it from a distance. And whilst people will be surprised, they won't be surprised when something appears from that. If you want it to be a surprise, if you want to scare the world a little bit, and I mean really throw them off their rocker, you have to develop it in your secret, secret place. Where they won't know and won't see it coming. The Treaty of Assize did stipulate that once the pre dreadnought battleships reached 20 years of age, they could be replaced by vessels which displace no more than 10,000 tons. Now, as I already explained, the Panzer Chief, the Deutschland class, they are not 10,000 tons. They are 10,800 tons in the standard and 14,500 uh, 14, tons. Oh, 14,290 long tons, 14,520 tons roughly in full load. That's rather a large amount of difference. It's made up for by the fact they have so much fuel aboard, but the thing is, again, these are ships which the Germans could have most likely got away with spending slightly more effort on. If they had built ships of... Hmm, well, it's difficult to say, but the French government were not going to really mobilise the French army over the Germans replacing their pre-dreadnoughts. They had friended at several points, but the French government really don't trust the French army that much, and the Germans do notice. And the Germans do push, because... Again, with these particular cruisers, they're going to have 11-inch guns. Heavy cruisers are supposed to have 8-inch guns. It would have been interesting to see what they could have done. Six 11 inch guns does not really build a ship, to my mind, that's more powerful than eight, 11, eight 8 inch guns. It sounds more powerful, it's got 11 inch guns, but it's just set itself in the middle there of a problem where your opponent is going to either have to respond one of two ways. One, send a pack of cruisers to fight you, or two, send a capital ship. In which case, it's not got enough. Imagine this vessel with nine 11 inch guns. Imagine it with three bank banks of engines and three shafts. Now, I haven't talked enough about the various theories of where these ships were supposed to develop. And honestly, it starts off with Rear Admiral, that's Contra Admiral, William McKellis, who issued a memorandum for the Reichs Marine in roughly September 1920, although he seems to have been working on it for about the previous two years which was emphasizing a fleet of coastal defense ships rather than an expansion. The German army, at this time, primarily 
assumed a future war with Poland. Basically, they are planning on taking back Poland. And the navy assumes that in, uh, it would be supporting in that conflict with Poland. Now, one of the interesting things about all this is at no point did the Germans start thinking the Polish want to be taken back control of. At no point do they start going, you know what, we are going to fundamentally believe as part of our planning that really, secretly, the Poles don't want to be their own nation. They want to be part of us. Which is sensible. Presuming that is a good way to lose. If it turns out to be the case, well, hey, you've won. But if you go in assuming that, it's a good way to find yourself losing a lot of troops and a lot of ships and a lot of equipment. They also presumed France would support Poland and Britain would remain neutral. Again, the amount of times the Germans always seem to presume Britain's going to remain neutral. This meant the French Navy was the most likely opponent. So theoretically, they're planning to fight them. And therefore, the publicly discussed and the scores that we often talk about is them being built to fight in the mid 1920s to 1930s to build and fight the French threat. With U-boats being used for a commerce raiding campaign under strict cruiser rules. Okay. So, they're not planning for unrestricted submarine warfare. They're planning for cruiser rules submarine warfare. This is pretty much orthodoxy until a certain Carl Donitz takes command of the U-boat arm. Now, Donitz advocated unrestricted submarine warfare and the use of wolf pack tactics, that is, multiple submarines to overwhelm convoy defences. He was a Holzendorf protégé. However, there is a small problem with this, okay? There's a small problem with the whole wolf pack tactics as a whole. It is easier and cheaper to build escorts like flower class corvettes than it is to build a submarine. It is easier and cheaper to train the, train the crew for something like... I don't know. For those flower class corvettes. For HMCS Sackville. Than it is to train a submarine's crew. There's also more limitations on the scope of reach of a submarine, and especially at this point in the 1930s, than there is on something like this. And again, this is the Graf Spade going into Montevideo. It looks a bit, sp a bit knocked about, doesn't it? It's still a proud ship. And there is a disconnect between unrestricted submarine warfare and what are you doing with your surface fleet? Because again, if you're going to rely on unrestricted submarine warfare being your primary offensive arm, and it has to be when you start employing it that way, because you don't want to get things in the way, what do you need to support it? Well, probably to support the submarines, you need to be able to get supply ships out to support them forward to move their base operating bases forward if possible which means you need ships which can escort those supply ships destroyers like cruisers and something like this but preferably with another three guns and another turret forward to provide you with the firepower to get there and get back unless someone wants to send a major force to intercept you in which case your submarines will be waiting and it could be problem very painful. That would be the strategic joined up perspective, but that's not what they do. That is not what they do.
the Germans, to an extent, apparently hoped that when they built the Deutschland, they would get invited into the Washington Treaty, London Treaty system. There seems to be a debate on the realistic hope about this, but of course the French vehemently opposed this. The French opposed this despite the fact that they could have been there for part of the setting the rules and limitations. Instead, what ends up happening is an Anglo-German naval agreement. Because the British can see it happening and Frank, think you either end up going to war with the Germans or you set some sort of treaty framework to limit it. And just randomly going to war to enforce the Treaty of Versailles is not going to be popular with the British public because the Treaty of Versailles had such famous quotes as we are going to squeeze the German orange until the pips squeak. Yeah. Attached to, attaching that quote to agreement doesn't sound fair or balanced, does it? It really doesn't. So they carry on building Panzerschief. However, they have a whole debate going over tactics. You have Reda as the head of the Reichsmarine. And he, of course, had been chief of staff to Hipper. And with the late 1930s also comes Adolf Hitler being Chancellor of Germany. Now, at this point, the Germans were building two D-class Panzerschiefs. These are improved vessels. The D-class are, well... When I say improved vessels, they still have the uh, six 11-inch guns. It's it's something which the Germans definitely liked more than I do. But they had six 11-inch guns. They were, I would say, an improved design in many regards. Certainly something quite nice looking and quite striking. But they weren't enough for Nazi Germany. They weren't enough for Hitler. Okay, Stalin, Hitler, Mussolini. And pretty much every dictator in true history seems to be obsessed with building big ships. Which have very big guns. Can't think what they're compensating for, but I'm fairly sure there must be something they're all compensating for. Perhaps it's a, a joint perceived idea of weakness. Oh, and by the way, there are some wonderful designs over, wiki, uh, over various parts of Wikipedia produced by Horatio Fails. And I know they have a real name, but that's the name they post these ships under. They're really well drawn. And if... I do go the direction of doing various projects which I am doing and I end up needing to commission someone to do drawings of ships for me. They are certainly someone I'm going to remember and see if I can't try and find a way of getting in contact with. Because they have a really nice line. Admittedly I'm very lucky in that I have a few people who follow me also produce really nice lines of ships. But the thing is about f having fans with it, they might not take money for it. And I don't like the idea of producing something for a book and then relying on people's generosity. But leaving that's completely off topic. You have a slow increasing of pace. Cancelling the D class and replacing them with Sean Horse and Nice and there is a problem with that, because while Scharnhorst and Eisenhower are lovely, they are armed with 9 11-inch guns. So they're armed with what I've been suggesting you should be arming the Panzer Chief with. Which does make them a very effective cruiser armament, but then you call them a battleship, and you're building them as a battleship, and they are used as a battleship. And they are battleships, but they are armed with 9 11-inch guns. And there are honestly battle cruisers walking around at this moment floating around, which have the ability to shrug off 11-inch round hits. 
as advanced and capable as they are, and when I say shrug them off, I don't mean at point blank range. I don't want someone commenting by going, at 4,000 yards, they would in, they would penetrate. They would at 4,000 yards, but standard engagement ranges of 18 to 24,000 yards, etc. Well, there are chunks of armor which those ships, which it would not penetrate those ships on with an 11 inch shell. And I do realize the Americans did some work after World War II and they were going, well, if the um, Hipper had been engaging with armor piercing, it would have penetrated Hood's armor at this and this point, and I do agree. There are chunks of the armor it could penetrate. Chunks of the armor it couldn't, but chunks of the armor it could. But they were firing higher explosive. So uh, they never did get to do that. But it's the same with these ships. 11 inch shells are scary, but if you load them with armor piercing, if you have nine of them are firing away and you're calling yourself a battleship, well, you're now definitely in the level at which battleships are going to be turning up and interested in you. But you're also in a level of, do you really want to go toe to toe with something like HMS Nelson or Rodney when they turn up? Because theoretically, they both have nine main guns. They're both battleships. Why does Nisenau run from Rodney? Well, it's because one's on with nine 16 inch guns. And is basically a floating metal block. And the other one is a finely designed battleship, but someone's still fitting them with 11 inch guns. Eventually, though, in 1935, you have the Anglo-German Naval Agreement. The Anglo-German Naval Agreement is a fine example of the Royal Navy going, we're going to be pragmatic about this. You are going to build up things. You are going to build up ships. We know you're going to do this. There is nothing we can do to stop you, other than go to war with you. So let's try and moderate this just a tad. This permitted Germany to build up to 35% of the strength of the Royal Navy in all warship categories. This led to the Bismarck class taking over from the Scharnhorst. Originally, they were going to be, have 35,000, 6,000, well, 36,000 tons, 35,000 long tons, 36,000 tons total, and 13 inch, that's 330 millimeter guns. However, when they learnt the regulars were coming, they decided to go for 42,000 tons and 15 inch, that's 380 millimeter guns. Yeah, caramba. The trouble about this policy is it's all incredibly reactive. And you're only really talking about battleships of the level of which Germany actually wants once you get to the H class. But each one is about ego and reaction. It's not a fought through policy. The Panzer Sheaf, the three of them, they're sensible vessels with that range. But everything's about fitting the guns to try and get them into the Washington Treaty System. To get them the status, the you know the honor of being part of it, and then when they don't get in there, oof, they're building more D-class. But then Hitler comes along, and Hitler's even more ego obsessed than the rest of them, and suddenly they're building battleships, which are armed with the same guns their cruisers were armed with. Okay, in pre-Dreadnought world, that makes sense. I mean, if you go back to... Gun, uh, ...main gunners, the battleships. Some even have bigger main guns than some battleships. But... By 1920s, 19, in 1920s, the treaties, etc. have established the theory that the battleship's guns are a lot bigger than the cruisers. And yes... This is the annoying thing for me. If 
I was going to be designing a German cruiser as I think they should be heavy building heavy cruisers. If you hadn't had the treaty system in the 1920s, 1930s, it would be 9 11-inch guns. Because that would be right up the German policy and it would fit. But... That doesn't happen. That isn't the world they're in. They're not in a logical world. They're in a world which has been... <sighs> reacting for too long. Reacting to the horrors of World War One, Reacting to the perception that World War One is caused by a naval race. When, in many ways, the naval race had kept stopped the wars turning out uh, happening for a good 20, 30 years. Because you can trace the race's origins back to the 1890s. And frankly, there are all sorts of different races going on there. So, you're not dealing with a world which necessarily makes sense. And you're not dealing with actors who necessarily perceive the world as it is, rather than what they want it to be. And you're not dealing with a scenario where people are necessarily actually acting in what we would consider a logical fashion. So there, there is the, we are building these cruisers to have a defensive policy, a coastal defensive policy. Then we're building cruisers for an expansion policy so we can be a presence around the world and a major power again. And then we're building cruisers so we can get into the Washington Treaty System. And then we're building cruisers as adjuncts to these massive battleships. We do not have the infrastructure to build so that we have some form of fleet. And then we're building Panzer Chief instead of those cruisers because we want to build something which is a qualitative advantage over the numerically superior cruisers because we've realized we can't build the same level that they can build. And it's just reaction after reaction after reaction. There is actually a debate as to what's going to happen with Sean Horst and Isaac. There is a debate about it. Usually it seems to me that they're going to be, to an extent, supporting the O-class battlecruisers when they come into service. Because... Despite the rearmament being pushed by Goering to increase the armed forces and to complete a plan by 1942. Her, the plan, actually, in the, the, the Plan Z, approved in 1939, is actually supposed to be completed by 1942. Uh, but this was then given promises that there wasn't going to be a war till 1948. The first draft had been Plan X. Then they made a pared down version which was Plan Y. And this led, this is where you get to Plan Z. You know, the, the radar goes through multiple plans. There's a whole debate as to whether or not you could defeat, and this is which Donnett's leading side going, we must use submarines, and Raider leading side going, we must use surface raiders to defeat the Royal Navy. Okay. So, I always think this is kind of interesting, because if the Germans build surface raiders... Yes, they're going to build their own cable assets. But that's presuming the British are going to stay still. That the British aren't going to build their own ships. That the British aren't going to use their own infrastructure, their own maritime industry to build their own ships. 
And yes, the British are dealing with the ja are dealing with the Japanese, the Italians, and the Germans. Uh, but so are the Americans. And there's also an extent to an extent the French. And any of these plans all seem to be working on the assumption that Britain and uh, Britain and America and France and all these powers are going to stand still, and they're not going to change their force structures. Because if you consider, if you're going for surface raiders only, how does Britain react to that? Well, they're probably going to have submarines doing close blockade on your coast, to try and take out larger ships when they try and put out the sea, but also they're going to have their cruisers and their capital ships hunting around in packs. And they're going to see you building them, so they're going to build their own vessels and equivalents. So that doesn't work. If you are honestly planning to build up to a fleet of 797 ships by 1948, which would include six H-class battleships, eight new panzer sheaf, of an enhanced Deutschland type and 249 U-boats. What do you think the Royal Navy is going to do? What do you think the French Navy? Oh, they're building nearly 250 submarines. Oh, we're going to stand still. The point I have to make to people is the flyer class are actually ordered in 1939 before war begins. They're ordered before war started. Months before war started. I, it's not a case of we think war's coming, it's a case of we think war's coming in the few next few years. We're starting to prepare for it. So if Germany had built 249 new boats, how many flower class corvettes and other things does the British have rolled off the yards in that time? And by the way, if you're building that many vessels, it's more difficult if you're trying to build with that volume for you to do technological upgrades, because then you need to upgrade the whole fleet, or you've got ships going out to sea, boats going out to sea, which are not in that place. Which then is going to place more of an infrastructure requirements and limitations on you. The larger the fleet you have, the more your infrastructure is going to be restrained, and the more infrastructure you're going to need. And this is the full point. If neither Raider or Donitz are right, and this is something which really annoys me when I'm looking at the German Navy, because I've done videos about the leaders of the various navies, the Axis Chiefs of Staff series. And I loved doing that series, but I did also find going through it that These officers are not thinking things through. They are in charge. They are responsible for a huge amount of resources. And yes, they're dealing with someone who has finally accrued political intelligence, I would argue. Finally accrued political intelligence. He's very good at getting his political point across. I don't agree with what he's saying. I don't like it. I don't agree with what he does, or support in any way, shape, or form. But do not detract from the fact that he managed to take over an entire nation by mostly political bluff and blunder. And that is a, that is a feat. It's also a very scary feat when you think about it, that someone like that, with such limited means in other, in other ways, when you look at the decisions that are made by them, actually achieves that status. Overall, their policy is to build up task forces of battleships and aircraft carriers that would then support the Panzer Chief and various light cruisers attacking British merchant marine around the world and use the submarines to make sure that the British couldn't directly fight them and win in a pitched battle. That is the plan. It's complete not a twaddle. <laughs> 
It's absolutely completely not a twaddle. It's a, it's one of those fantasy plans you see people write up and they go, well, we're going to do this, this, and this by this time period and do it this way. And you sit there and go, really? How? Okay. Let's start for it. So you've got the H-Class battleships being laid down. It gets the 1948. 1948 is nine years later than 1939. What does the Royal Navy of 1948 look like? Well, they're going to have Lion-class battleships and whatever came after the Lion-class in service. They're going to have vanguards. They're going to have possibly have KGVs. They might have got rid of them. They might have changed their guns. They're going to be on whatever carriers came after the Implacables. And they're probably going to be big. And capable. They're going to probably have churned out a huge number of flower class corvettes, etc., which will be manned by reservists around the Commonwealth. They will have used that those flower class corvettes and probably other vessels like we might even actually upgrade and built to frigate level by that point. They'll do it more slowly. They'll have hunt-class escort destroyers and flower-class corvettes and whatever successor to the tribals are in service. By 1948, who are going to who are the admirals you're going to be placing? Well, again, that's nine years down the road. So yes, there are going to be a fair number of differences. You're not going to have cunning around. You're not going to have. Any of them big names we know of, really. But you're probably going to have Vian around. And a few other officers. You're going to have all the really aggressive officers, if you think about it. You go through the Royal Navy and you go think of those officers. Those are the ones who are going to be around. And then you think about what the German military is going to be like. You think about what's been going on in the Soviet military, another totalitarian system, or the Italian military. The Italian military, it's been political intrigues and political intrigues and political intrigues which have sapped the leadership of much of their ability to actually make a decision, actually do something they're supposed to, and actually behave in a competent manner. Think about the Soviet military. Well, in 1937, there is a purge the purge is focused on people who are imagined to be anti the Soviet Union, but the odds are they are just anti-Stalin, if anything, but more than likely Stalin perceives them as a threat because they're actually capable of doing their job. Oh, good lord, lubber duck. So what's likely to happen in Germany in that time? Well, there's already been the Night of the Long Knives. This is the point. Hitler's already done that on his way up to power. He's already got rid of people who were theoretically loyal to him, but who he perceived as a threat and who probably were a threat. They were certainly drugged up enough to be a problem. So what's going to happen in nine years? Is there any chance that Raid is still alive in nine years' time? Probably not. Donitz? No. So it'll be someone else. So you'll have had... Not just one new chief of staff, but two chiefs of staff on that way with God knows what ideas. And here is the real question. Bismarck, Tirpitz were expediated, enhanced efforts. They were laid down in 1936, launched in 1939 and commissioned... Well, they launched in February 1939 and commissioned in August 1940. In the case of Bismarck, Tirpitz laid down November 1936, launched April 1939, commissioned February 1941. That's not exactly quick construction, is it? I mean, they started on this next pair, and the next pair, of course, are the immutable. 
the Never Unstoppable, the amazingly named and always overblown H-Class, which were to be armed with eight 16-inch guns. I'm sorry, but there's already Nelson and Rodney going around which have nine, and there are the various American ones on the right way which have nine, and you have eight? It's not exactly earth shattering. And it's a 30 knot speed, 53,400 tons in standard, 56,400 tons in combat load, and 63 and a half, well, then the 63.6 thousand tons full load. 19,200 nautical miles at 19 knots. Oh, and they have the 12 man diesel engines. There is a reason these ships are often put in as being an amazing thing. And there's a reason I'm talking about battleships when I talk about cruisers. These sound frankly amazing. But they're not. They're incredibly conventional. For the amount of weight you're putting out there, for the amount of displacement you're building, this is an incredibly conservative, incredibly con conventional design. You almost wonder where the weight's coming from. And this is a big problem when we start getting into it. You now have not only a mucked up strategy and different ideas constantly competing and turning over each other over what you actually want every ship is a christmas tree project every ship has to be everything to everyone 19,200 nautical miles at 19 knots that's great but why in the frigating of all things frigating Am I sailing my ship the entire way to the Falkland Islands and back without refueling it? It's nice to be able to do. But. Why? Why am I doing that? Falkland Islands, from, uh, Falkland Islands is 8,000 nautical miles from the UK. Sailing it there and back is, I suppose, 16,000 nautical miles. But I'm adding on a, you know, a, a, a few thousand miles extra for turning around and doing things and dealing with the weather. It's wonderful, but it's a case of why. I can understand why you need it for your panzer sheath. I can understand why they need they're your commerce raiders. But please tell me you're not plan your plan isn't to send your entire battleship uh your battleship out commerce raiding. Oh, it is. Okay. So you're sending out something which is a high status, high value unit on something which is inherently a highly exposed, highly dangerous operation. Because you've got no bases, no safe places to go to re fix your ship. So it's going to go out and even no matter how powerful it is with its 11.8 inch main belt and its bulkheads being 8.7 inches and its barbettes being 14.4 inches and its decks being up to 4.7 inches and having up maybe carrying a nine Arado 196 seaplanes, it's gonna die a death of a thousand cuts. Or are you going to send it out in a task group? Two of them and a Graf Zeppelin. Oh, I'm so scared. Most inefficient carrier design ever designed by mankind. The only thing which makes it for me thankful the Italians never developed a carrier because if they base it off that, which it looks like they were doing, goodness help them. Because that really would have been a waste of life.
what's more interesting than that is the name of the status of the names. And again, this shows you the problem the high command. You've got an entire idea based on the raiding strategy, and yet you have a high command, namely Hitler, but actually not just Hitler. It's always blamed on only Hitler, but it's the entire strategic high command of Germany seems to share this entire distaste and fear of losing anything. Is that the names for the H class. Should not be connected with the Third Reich. Or with Germany. So. Hindenburg. Friedrich the Gross. What's Friedrich the Great? Uh, Grob Dutschland. Uh, or Greater Jutland. Uh, Greater Germany. Grob Dutschland. Completely. Not likely. There are various people who put it more politely than me, but no, not a chance in hooping all Um There's all sorts of names put forward as various things that he might have put forward in both, but I, I think probably, if anything to go by, I'm probably going to pro uh, follow the policy that starts with Blucher of very random military personalities from history. If you cannot even, if the Ober if the Ober Commander the Marine, of uh, you know, cannot even get a capital ship program going, and those are fairly simple, because let's be honest, what are you building a capital ship to be? To be the biggest, baddest, scariest thing we can possibly build. That's it. That's the framework for a capital ship construction program. We are building something which is supposed to be the biggest, baddest, scariest thing we can build. In peacetime, it's our major diplomatic asset to say, look at how big and mean this thing is. In wartime, it's supposed to be able to pummel the other uh, the other side's version of it. That's it. And take a pummeling itself. It That is complicated, but it's also relatively simple. Building a cruiser means you have to decide which mission set you want that cruiser for. Whether you want it to be... A light surface raider slash mine layer, whether you want it to be a heavy long range surface raider, whether you want it to be a reconnaissance asset, whether you want it to be a fleet asset, whether you want it to be a flagship. All these things are criteria which you have to start thinking through. You have no chance. Absolutely no chance. If you cannot get a capital ship program in place of being able to work out your cruiser program. So why are these ships so inefficient on both the level of strategy and design? Well, design has said is a Christmas tree project. If you look at the hippers, for example, and you start going through, they're carrying... The 8 inch guns, the 4.1 inch guns, the 1.5 inch guns, the 0.79 inch guns, the 21 centimeter torpedoes. Or 21 inch torpedoes, sorry. Okay. Alright. That's not too bad. In terms of armament mix, if we consider town class or county class, they carry the eight and six inch torpedo, so eight and six inch guns, then they carry four inch AA guns, and then they carry a cannon. And they might have machine guns as well. And they'd have torpedoes. But then you look at those guns. And every single one is perfect for their role, but maintenance heavy. So, you've not fitted an unusual in terms of gunnery system amount of guns, but you fitted a perfect gun for the role, but it's a maintenance heavy version of that gun. This gun on paper is the perfect performance. As long as it's maintained to this standard. If there is any problem with maintenance, it's going to be a problem. Then you have the fact that you know 
you know they need Atlantic slash Clipper Bell, especially if they're going to have to operate in the Atlantic. However, they're all built with the Baltic straight bow. Why? And then you refit them with it. Which is not an easy task. Why not change the construction? Why? Because there is such a, deb a debate going on over it. Every single group and faction within the over commando let alone within the the actual navy itself the uh, kriegsmarine by this point kriegsmarine has to have a say has to put forward their perspective has to get into it the whole of nazi germany is competing authorities and people building up their own little fiefdoms of power and bureaucracy. It's absurd. And the more you look into it, the more you see this, because if you read one book, you'll read about this person doing this, 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 and then if you read another book, you read about another person doing the exactly same things, you go, well, are they the same person? No, no, no. They are they're little sub-departments, and they are completely and utterly replicating the work each other is doing. So, this slows down your construction design process humongously. Because you have everyone trying to do everything and compete on everything. It's a wonder they build any ships at all. I mean, the sheer amount of bureaucracy... There is an often joke in the Royal Navy that the reason that naval constructors moved to Bath was to get as far away from the Admiralty's bureaucracy as physically possible to give them space to think. Well, the German equivalent within the Oberkommando der Marine and their force is like they've taken the DNC and split the naval constructors up amongst all the departments. And each department is trying to be naval constructors. And each department is trying to get into Bolton. And it's just... Why? And you look at it and you go, right then, this ship on its prima facie listing, I am expecting a ship of this. And then it's not. It's massively heavier and bigger. Which is inefficient to build beyond belief as well because if you're building a ship which is bigger than it needs to be for the role and equipment you're putting in it that means more steel that means more time to construct that means you have to use your larger slips for it it takes up more space more time, more effort than it needs to German cruisers have some really nice lines. I can look at this bow, I can look at the whole line, and I can go, cool. I can look at that stern and the position of the guns, and I can go, oh, it makes sense. I can see their logic, but oh... But I can also sit here and go, at no point did someone sit there and go, I'll be sure about this. And you can tell this is the case with the German construction. Everyone's very scared, this is even worse than Soviet construction, everyone is very scared to start critiquing things and go, should we be doing this? Because... The answer might not be yes or no. The answer might be off of your head, you traitorous whatever. That's the problem in a dictatorship. In a totalitarian state. It's not... The big dictator is a massive... Mm. 
the Kinsian. True, but the trouble is, all the people down the line who tried to emulate that Dickensian character and become absurdly, uh, absurdly Dickensian themselves. There is a very simple idea behind this ship, but it would also been very easy to fix. If you're already ignoring tonnage limitations, and the Germans, let's be honest, were ignoring tonnage limitations, and they're already baiting people with the 11-inch guns and the Deutschlands, etc. Which they justified as, we're replacing the pre-dreadnoughts. We're allowed to replace the pre-dreadnoughts. We don't want to fit 8-inch guns because you're replacing a vessel which had these guns. Okay, fine. They have a habit of building triple turrets, which is another reason why I have problems with the 8-inch. Because triple turrets actually make sense for the Germans. If you can't build as many ships due to your infrastructure, then make sure your ships have as capable and are efficiently designed as possible. So triple guns are a uh, triple turrets are a way to do it. Because yes. One gun per turret produces this many problems. Two guns per turret produce this many problems. Three guns per turret produce this many problems. Well, one times many, as many problems. Four times many problems for three guns. There is also a level of three guns per turret. Means that each turret is able to do, to an extent, an independent ranging salvo if they need to. Three guns is the minimum you can use for that. So, at basic point, you would expect all German ships, cruisers, etc., to be 12 gun designs. And it would make sense for them to be. Especially as they would have the, ca can have the case, and again, you can make the case quite easily in the Baltic. You'd go, right in the Baltic, we have designed new ships for Baltic operations, as you know, and. Uh, they basically we've decided that they should have no armor. Just lie shamelessly. They have no armor because there is no place for them to hide in the Baltic. But instead, they keep churning out ships with heavy guns on the rear and coming up ideas which are heavy guns at the rear. So your heavier firepower is on your stern. Yes, you have a broadside capability and you can argue that, but ships don't really fight on broadside that often. They often fight at angles to each other. Battle of the Plate is a good example. The Battle of Denmark Dredges also happens as they're fighting at sort of angles. They, there is a point where they are sort of broadside on the broadside, but at the most point they're fighting at angles. Which means... You want balanced for and aft fire, a la tribal class, a la county class, a la town class, Leander class. The British did it with the air refusers, but they went renowned style, heavy gun and multiple guns forward. Which is a kind of interesting scenario. You could have theoretically, in a world where this is built, you could end up in a scenario where an Arafusa would be chasing one of these. The Spakras of 1939. These are the light, these are the scout cruisers designs. And you have to wonder, yeah, that would have been an interesting scenario, but there's also another problem with that one, as far as I'm concerned, in that if that's my main firing, and that's where my mines are, I'm going to want to get my mines off my ship as quickly as possible. Because the last thing I want is one of my own shells, or one of my own guns, to accidentally clip a mine, let alone the shells which will be aimed for those guns to accidentally clip a mine. Because that's a good way to lose a ship.
So, Scharnhorst. In many ways, in large Deutschland class. <laughs> and actually, as I said, they are the ships I like the most of the whole period of this design. They are the ones which I have the most respect for, but I do treat them as, in many ways as large Deutschlands. I don't expect them to fight a capital ship. They've got 11 inch guns. But they can scare the bejesus out of everything else. The fact is, though, they are armoured, they are a battleship. But they're a battleship with a case of... Okay, right then. Yeah, this is not going to end well. We're going to get severely damaged. We'll win this fight, but we're going to get absolutely beaten up. And the trouble is, if we get beaten up, well, they're not going to get home, because someone else is going to come along after them. That's always the problem for the Germans. And that's such a really strategic situation they don't really consider. They jump from being focused on fighting the Polish, then the French, because if you're going for a war the Polish, you're going to end up a war the French. Which they probably should have a discussion with the Soviet Union about, because the Soviet Union had gone to war the Polish and not ended up at war the French. But perhaps Germany felt they were a special case, where if they went to war with the Poles, the French would quite happily attack their behind. Which I can understand. There is history going on here. But still, you're then reacting, and then you are building to fight the Royal Navy. And, oh yes, by the way, the Germans could design a balanced cruiser. Meet the M-Class. On the Hippers. And technically, I suppose, the Deutschland class are balanced, because they have three guns either end in one turret over end, but... No... Sometimes considered the German response and answer to the towns. I'd say more a response to the Leanders, but there again, I might be being picky. <laughs> the German Navy... What can I say about them? They have potential. The Germans actually have very good engineers. And yes, they do design things which are engineeringly perfect. But that's not necessarily a bad thing. It's only a bad thing when you don't have anyone to stop. And it turns into a competing mess by multiple different engineering factions. Each trying to outdo each other by making their own design more their own section design more perfect and take up more space than the others. So I'm sort of competing for we design the most of this ship. Yes, you will design the most of this ship to such an extent that each of your areas is twice the size it's supposed to be, so the ship's gonna be three times the size it was supposed to be. Because as well as you designing that, other people added in things which weren't going to be there in the first place. <sighs> anyway. German cruise policy. Lots of potential. Lots of plans. Lots of theories. Terrible execution. Terrible execution. And mostly that's because of the system they're in. But also because of the fact that at no point does anyone really turn around to either Donitz or Raider and go, but what if you're wrong? And why don't we just work together to make this work out sensibly? Instead of treating it as an either or scenario. And what's interesting is that for years advocating it, when Donuts actually gets to the power, he suddenly starts making backtracking and making a case for a combined policy because he knows that's a sensible thing to do. But he's lost Raider, who used to make that case. Because Raider's fallen from uh, fallen from grace. Anyway. Thank you for watching. Hope you enjoyed.
I'm going to be producing so many videos, I'm not going to bother too much. But um, what we've got coming up are... Oh, yes. We got to 9,069. I thought you would like to see that one. Add it in there. We're now a little bit over that, so thank you. And these are Christmas topics coming up. Well, of course, the German heavy cruisers was live on Thursday. And then you had the Soviet Navy come out yesterday. And the live for that is on the 23rd of... 23rd of December. We have all these videos programmed in. There are going to be more videos on the week, on the first week of January, because I plan to keep up this process into the first week of January. And after that, go back to the more normal, and I say this politely, more normal couple of video, uh, couple of videos, sort of a week thing. Two recorded videos, brew ships and two la and a lot and a Thursday live, because. I'd like to get more writing done. But, as said, I I wanted to do something special for Christmas. <sighs> I'm working out what the plan is for next year. Next year will not be this many videos on me. Mainly because I'm up the let grade, I think, of them. And I'm trying to put more into them. So this does make them more complicated. But I hope you enjoy them all. I, myself, am looking forward to... Well, I'm recording all the Soviet ones as we speak, the Soviet Navy ones. And I'm looking forward to, I think, Sackville, Warrior, and Haida, especially. I hope you're going to enjoy those. Thank you very much for watching. Take care, and have a nice evening.